Good morning, everybody. My name is Zafar Hashmi. I'm an advisor for the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, known as SIGAR, but here today appearing as a member of the Kamka Network from Afghanistan. Uh, it's an honor to be with such a distinguished group of fellows and panelists, as well as, more importantly, you all here. Um, as you've noticed over the last couple of days, at the Kamka reunion that the conversation around Afghanistan this time is different. It's sober, it's sad. And with that in mind, I'd like to make a somber request. That is to take a few minutes, a few seconds of silence to honor the sacrifices of 92,000 Afghan soldiers and over 3,590 American and NATO soldiers who paid the ultimate price thinking and believing that democracy had a shot in Afghanistan. Thank you. And with that, a couple of administrative and housekeeping rules. Uh, whatever I'm going to say today is my own personal views and my, through my association with the Kamka Network and not of my employer or the US government. Uh, we're going to uh, keep the conversation as conversational as possible. And uh, I'd request my uh, fellow panelists to keep the answers and questions and comments ideally under two minutes. The same would apply to the audience when we go to questions uh, at the end of the session. And uh, I'd request my panelists to feel free to interact with each other uh, whenever they feel like it. But before doing so, I was told that this panel has to be forward-looking, as optimistic and as uh, Ironic it sounds about Afghanistan. So uh, I decided to do a stock taking of what's happening in Afghanistan uh, since uh, Taliban takeover in August of 2021. And I have a few points that uh, relates to what's happening domestically, uh, some uh, implications of the Taliban and the new order in Afghanistan that relates to the region, as well as some global uh, implications. So let's start right into the domestics. Since ta Taliban takeover, 270 days that girls grade 6 and above are not allowed to go to school. Women in the civil service, particularly judiciary, are increasingly marginalized, their salaries are not paid, and forcefully and silently are forced to resign. Since the Taliban takeover, 300 and 231 media outlets have closed. 84% of female journalists were forced to quit, and the remainders are forced to cover their faces when on air. At least 32 journalists have been detained just for being a journalist and doing, doing their jobs. A couple of uh, quotes and figures from the Freedom House ranking of Afghanistan. Afghanistan's political rights, one out of 40, one being the worst. Civil rights and uh, civil liberties, nine out of 60. And the overall freedom index, global freedom index in Afghanistan is 10 out of 100. For Kamka reference, Mongolia ranks the highest with 84, and Afghanistan is still ahead of Azerbaijan, which is nine, Tajikistan, which is eight, and Turkmenistan, which is only two. Taliban have killed and forcefully disappeared at least 500 former Afghan soldiers and members of the security sector. According to UN and Human Rights Watch reports, it's possible that the Taliban have committed war crimes and increasing abuses including torture in areas of Afghanistan where there are resistance against the Taliban, particularly Panjshir, Daikundi, uh, Andarabs, and Tahad provinces. Taliban have threatened women protesters. 
that they are going to be forced married to the Taliban fighters should they choose to continue protesting the Taliban. There is two types of rift within, within the Taliban movement as the de facto authorities. One is between the Taliban of uh, southern Afghanistan and the Haqqani networks, and the other rift that is not talked about enough is the rift between the uh, conservatives, ultra-conservatives, and the quote-unquote moderates of the Taliban, which is in of itself a recipe for internal implosion. Taliban claim that security have, has improved in Afghanistan. On the contrary, it is lack of war by an insurgent group that is now the de facto authority of Af authorities of Afghanistan. Instead, there are reports, credible reports, that criminality is skyrocketing in Afghanistan because there is a nexus of uh, terrorists and criminal networks. Regionally, Al-Qaeda and other terrorist groups, particularly from Central Asian countries, are regrouping, re-energizing, and strengthening forces in Afghanistan with broader implications for the region and beyond. And Taliban fighters have had already clashes with border forces of Pakistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, and Iran. Iran, China, Pakistan, Russia have accepted Taliban diplomats, and they have some sort of embassy operations in Kabul. Additionally, Germany, EU, Qatar, UAE are the uh, countries that have, that have some sort of uh, diplomatic presence in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. India has even showed willingness to open a consulate in the country. However, no country has so far recognized the Taliban as the legitimate government of Afghanistan. As of last night, Russia was the only country that has showed some willingness to do so in the near future. Chinese companies, Chinese diplomats have traveled to Kabul and other provinces to tap into uh, mineral opportunities. Similar uh, reports have been uh, there about Russians making the same adventures in Afghanistan. Globally, the UN has received so far $1.5 billion to do humanitarian delivery as well as pay salaries of the Afghan civil servants because the Afghan economy being under sanction under the Taliban is crumbling. The entire leadership of the Taliban, including the Haqqani network, are still under the heavy sanctions of UN and US. Current Taliban interior minister, Saraj Haqqani, has $10 million and his uncle, Khalil Haqqani, who is the Minister of Refugees, has $5 million FBI, FBI bounty on their heads. So with these facts, we're going to try to move forward with this discussion and see where we are. And to my right, I have Scott. All of our panelists have their bios with extensive experience about Afghanistan and the region, but I'm gonna be short and just say the current uh, title. Scott Warden is the Director of Afghanistan and Central Asia Programs at the USIP. And my question first to Scott is that two administrations, both Democratic and Republican, and the entire DC political machinery, including the think tanks, were in this belief that we have to negotiate with the Taliban and have a negotiated settlement because the war did not turn out the way we wanted it to be. In other words, the Taliban were not militarily defeated. That was the narrative. How did that work? It's a big question. First of all, let me say thanks for having me and thanks to the Camp Kit Forum. Uh, and, and thank you for the, as you say, sober and sad readout of, of the current situation. Clearly, uh, the circumstances are, are dire and, and I think also the trend lines uh, are heading in the wrong direction uh, for the benefit of the Afghans. You know, as far as the, uh, the negotiation goes, I think clearly it didn't go well. Uh, that's obvious. So, you know, why did it not go well? Uh, and what does that tell us about the future is, is, uh, is a challenging question. You know, I think, and coming from the United States Institute of Peace, I would say this, uh, but a negotiated political settlement 
uh, can have a lot of different end states. Uh, obviously, the US and, and I think the Afghan government and, and many of the Afghan people were hoping for one uh, that would be much more in terms of political power sharing. Uh, that can also take many different forms. It doesn't have to be a national unity government, which mm -hmm. also didn't work out very well. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think that US domestic opinion uh, was an X factor, if you will, in, in this negotiation. And also President Biden uh, clearly had strong personal convictions, having worked on Afghanistan from his time as vice president, never mind the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, that said that it was time to go. Uh, I think this really impeded whatever negotiating strategy there was, because the Taliban were able to test that position subtly over time to see, did we care about the outcome? Did we care about intra-Afghan negotiations uh, more than we cared about troop timelines and troop presence? And I think it became clear to everybody uh, at the end, at least to the Taliban, that we cared more about the timeline. And mm. that's not a, a strong foundation for uh, a productive negotiation or a meaningful compromise. Thank you. Uh we're not gonna be dwelling over the past, but it's impossible not to. Uh, Shwai Brahim, just to follow up on what uh, Scott said. Uh, Shwai Brahim is a former uh, professor, associated professor of the uh, American University of Afghanistan, currently a fellow at New School in New York, but also he used to be a, an advisor for the Afghan Ministry of Peace. Were you enabled by the previous leadership to negotiate and strike a deal, or the Taliban realized that they could militarily take over because, as Scott said, there was a timeline that was more important for the Americans. Uh, thank you very much, Zafar. Um, I'd like to start off by picking on a, the statement Scott made, which is, at the end of the day, the US did not care about the outcome of the peace process. I think that's a pretty damn, damning statement to make. That's a paraphrase, but yes. <laughs> well, I mean, relatively speaking, they didn't care about the outcome of the peace process relative to the timeline of the withdrawal. So the um, Republic negotiating team or the Republic peace infrastructure had a decision to make. And I think it split into two camps. One was the palace and Ashraf Ghani's position. The other was all the other political actors within the country. I think both of them had short-term um, short -term goals or short-term short -term targets to try and achieve within this context, realizing that the US didn't really care. Um, in hindsight. But did the Afghans care? Well, the people cared. I think when I say Afghans, I mean the political leadership, those who were in Doha negotiating with the Taliban, knowing the urgency of the situation. I think you have to understand that there was a bit of delusion involved. There's so many elements of this that it's hard to paint a clear and simple picture. Some did not believe that the US will actually leave. Until August 15th itself, people were still assessing a continuation of uh, defense, a continuation of the Republic, a continuation of the fight. Because that conversation was still not clear. The U.S. was literally leaving and they were like, no, the U.S. isn't really leaving. They're like, what other proof do you need? I think that muddied the waters in terms of policy clarity. But coming to your initial question, was the Doha negotiating team empowered to strike a deal with the Taliban? The clear answer is no. But there's, a, there's another side to that coin. The Taliban delegation were also not in power or in a position to strike a deal either. They were not even interested. So this was a lose-lose setting. Everybody tried to achieve their own targets. The biggest stakeholder being the United States, wanting to achieve US withdrawal. The way it was managed, it was you know, one of the most shameful withdrawals in US history, if not, if not the most. So, so no, it was not empowered, but neither were the Taliban Neither were the Taliban negotiating team. So it was a recipe for disaster. And I think that call- A recipe for disaster for, for the, the Republic the side. Uh, General Alizai, Hebatullah Alizai was the last 
Army Chief of Afghan Forces, and he has had a number of other forces. So while the politicians were busy in Doha, in two, two split camps, you were fighting the fight across Afghanistan. How was that split resonating and decaying the morale of the Afghan forces while the Taliban were advancing? Well, uh, thank you, uh, Hashmi Sab. Uh, I am really delighted to be a part of this conversation today in Kamka. Uh, I think uh, the problem started when the U.S. started negotiations with terrorists. As you said, uh, Saraj Haqqani, uh, his uncle, most of the uh, Taliban leaders, they, are, they, 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 they used to be in blacklist for, uh, of FBI, but when you are going and starting negotiating, regardless of uh, 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 whatever casualties you have taken in the last 20 years, and, and you want to show that you are going to solve an internal problem in Afghanistan as a third party, that, that was the start. On 28th of February 2020, when the Doha deal was signed, there was a uh, a reduction in violence phase for one week, but it was extended for one month. Mm. And those extensions and then the ceasefires two more times when that was during the Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Adha of 2020, uh, they were just for three or four days, but they affected the, uh, uh, they were expanded and extended for almost a month. So I will tell you, I was in, in the North at that time, and I had lots of plans, of operational plans, and I was kind of, uh, taking over districts from Taliban. Hamab district is a good example. Uh, the Anthui four districts were clear from Taliban, but I was all, every day I was, I was receiving a call from some of the, the US sites and from some of our government officials that, what are you doing? You're violating the Doha deal. Mm -hmm. And I, my question to them was that, what is Doha deal? Is that, and they were saying like, this is US Taliban deal. I said, yeah, of course, this is US, Afghan, uh, US uh, Taliban deal, but it's not Afghan Taliban deal. So why should I stop operating against these people? If I stop, they will come around all my checkpoints and bases, and they will attack my personnel, and I will, uh, they will cause me casualties. They will get the ground. And I have several, several examples for them. And then in 2021, when I was Special Forces Commander for, for, for all the soft units, one of my commanders, uh, previous commanders, is also in this room. We punished Taliban militarily. The expectation in May 1st, 2021 was that Taliban should at least take over two to five provinces. And that, that was in all international media. But they couldn't take a single district. You know why? Did you have the tools, the willingness, the equipment to fight the Taliban? So that, and if you did, then why failure? So here's the point. The Taliban couldn't fight us. That's reality. They didn't have the morale to fight us on the ground. Then they, they, they started sending elders to negotiate with the local forces post May 1st, 2021, when they realized they can't win militarily. And unfortunately, in this phase, some of the local politicians, then to the almost uh, the opposition politicians of Afghan government at that time, were also pushing for this. I will give you one, one, one memory of But me. I'll give you one example. You did not have a sitting defense minister amidst a war. He was in a hospital getting treatment for wounds that he had received earlier. There were constant changes and the military leadership. Yes. How was that affecting the fight? That's, that's absolutely. We have got a very strong team in MOD in 2019, and we caused Taliban massive casualties during 2019 until February 2020. But in 2021, the political leadership of Afghanistan, that was palace, so-called palace, and the so-called uh, team of uh, the triangle team, 
They were afraid of us. I don't know why. You can ask them this question. They were afraid of a strong team in MOD fighting decisively against the terrorists and Taliban. And they were like, they were firing one at a time. They fired Asadullah Khalid in, in a very, when, when he was, uh, after, after he came back from his treatment, they just fired him. Mm -hmm. Why they didn't fire him during his treatment is a question. Then Dr. Zia. And then they brought someone like Wali Ahmad Zai that couldn't secure north of Afghanistan. He couldn't secure Helmand. And we went there to solve all those problems there. And then they became uh, automatically our boss. So what the, the Dr. Mohib, President Ghani, they have to tell why they appointed such pe people as our leaders. According to the equipment, we were good, what, but we were not very good according to the equipment. Because I can tell you, most 90% of the uh, airstrikes were being provided by US uh, uh, forces in Afghanistan to us uh, till 2020. Uh, uh, February 2020. And after that, dramatically, it, it, it just dropped. And then we didn't have enough assets to cover the whole Afghanistan, to cover the, whole, the entire country. We had thousands of checkpoints and bases around the country. They needed supplies. They needed rotations. They needed uh, uh, medevac, uh, they, 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 they They needed help Thank and you. support. But th those were not enough. We asked for this during 2021, post May uh, or, or April, when the President uh, of the United States announced the final date for the uh, uh, withdrawal. But we were promised in a way, but we didn't get anything that was effective for the fight and a replacement when the US air support will not be in Afghanistan. How will we uh, support our forces and fighting 22 uh, in, uh, international terrorist organizations in that country without a, a, a massive support. Thank you. So lots of terrorist organizations in Afghanistan. Taliban 2.0, Dr. Uh, Nilo Farsakhi, who is a professional lecturer at George Washington University, among many, many hats that she wears on a daily basis. Unpack what has happened moving forward. Did the Taliban, could the Taliban deliver their commitments, especially what they have uh, promised the U.S. negotiators in Doha, particularly counterterrorism? Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Kamka, for having me over here today. Um, well, just to set the ground, it was a tragedy. Taliban takeover for Afghanistan was tragedy for many of us who started working as an honest state. Uh, in, in non state sectors on promotion of democracy, human rights, women's rights, and setting up institutions. So it was tragedy. We are still suffering, all of us, from the shock. We were uh, thinking, I have been involved in peace processes of 2010, from 2010 onwards. We have been uh, expecting a change, but not such drastic change of a system change. So it was a tragedy for the country, and the country is going to suffer for the, if it, this tragedy exists for a long time. Uh, coming back to your question, uh, Mr. Hashimi, I think um, I, I was looking very closely at the security uh, uh, implications of the Taliban takeover, both inside Afghanistan, as you beautifully covered about the um, uh, implications, and regionally and globally. And I have been, I've been saying this in many, many platforms, that if it's not going to prevent, uh, I mean, the Taliban regime overall will not be sorted out. Uh, it will going to impact the global peace. And I have facts and data to show that based on the uh, at least uh, months of research now. For the regional impact that you're saying, I have noted some very um, uh, clear groups that are taking shape in Afghanistan. And we have the data that again shows those, those groups are, are taking shape. First and the foremost one, TTP. Since the Taliban takeover, TTP has conducted more than 200. TTP being the Pakistani Taliban. Taliban that want the same thing for Pakistan that is happening in Afghanistan. Yeah, and they are the friends. They are the friends of Taliban. So they have conducted more than 200 attacks against the Pakistan establishment, including security of Pakistan and all. And the number is increasing. They are in the negotiation right now with the government of Pakistan, and they are exactly using the same pattern that Afghan Taliban were, were using. So that's one. The second one, JMB. JMB is a group, uh, uh, Mujahideen of Bangladesh. 
that uh, Jamaat Mujahideen of Bangladesh, and they have they had links with the Taliban in the 1990s. Soon after the Taliban takeover, there is a statement, and they used Taliban model as a as a model to withdraw the uh, the, the system. Coming back to the Central Asian countries, I have uh, data about Jamaat Ansarullah. Jamaat Ansarullah, Tajik militant group, banned in Tajikistan, but uh, supported, of course, friends to Taliban, and supported by Taliban. Some of their members are hired by the Taliban for, for maintaining security of Badakhshan. So they are right now in Badakhshan, and they are the banned in Tajikistan. There are groups like TIP, um, ETIM, known as ETIM, and and, and many others that we can name that they are currently based, based on the data. And since the Taliban takeover, they are actually kind of trying to organize themselves. So yes, there is a threat to the security of the region. And this group emboldened by the Taliban takeover, the jihadists inspired in the region with the Taliban takeover. And the most important thing, coming back to your specific to your question, the recent report in May, uh, by the UN in May of 2022, Taliban did not cut ties with Al-Qaeda. And that was one of the, um, I think, uh, requirement that they should cut ties with, with, with Al-Qaeda, that the ties still there. So overall, Taliban are building their closer relationship with all different jihadist groups and terrorist groups in the region. And it's quiet right now. The situation is quiet since Taliban take over. Why? Because Taliban are in the process of consolidation of power. And they are going to fight their rivals. They're going to silence the progressives. And they are going to consolidate and bring all these other factions together. Therefore, I don't know how to be optimistic when you said talk about the future. And, and if we just tie all these notes, it's really not an optimistic situation uh, going forward with the Taliban takeover. I stop there. Thank you. Uh, Scott. What options do we have right now? The US does not have a presence in Afghanistan. Taliban claim that they have defeated an empire. They are the new reality, the new uh, boss in town. What leverage does the US have? If we put aside the uh, attention that the war in Ukraine is getting, to care if it is going to care about Afghanistan at all. At all because we have an upcoming midterm, and we also have the uh, 2024 presidential elections. Afghanistan is going to be a blame game for both sides, because the Trump administration started the deal, the Biden administration followed suit. So they have equal opportunities to strike at each other. Should they care? Do they care? And how? Good questions. So this seems like a good opportunity for me, like you, to say, first of all, USIP is a nonpartisan and non-governmental institution, and I'm speaking in my personal capacity, uh, speci specifically when it comes to anything touching on domestic politics. Um, the US leverage is very limited. Uh, you know, the troops were, I think, the troop presence and the military force that they conveyed was our biggest source of leverage. Uh, we don't have that. Uh, you know, financially, it's, I think, more leverage to be giving aid. Uh, humanitarian assistance is badly needed, should not be, is not conditioned, uh, because that's for the Afghan people. So take that off the table. And then, of course, we're not giving any uh, economic assistance directly to the Taliban. Uh, for or now. For ne well, for now, for the foreseeable future. I don't, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, my own view would also be that, that with that, we have stopped giving assistance to Afghan civil society groups. Uh, which, uh, though, though weak uh, and threatened, still needs support. So I'll put in a plug for that. Um, but that said, I think that you know, most of our leverage as the US is, in effect, negative leverage. We will not recognize you. We will not release reserves. Uh, you know, we will not normalize diplomatic relations uh, until conditions improve, improve. That's not proving to be very effective. I think. When we look to the, let's say, medium and longer term, you know, the Taliban, uh, although they have a dominant position, although I agree, unfortunately, that, that this is not going to be challenged uh, very strongly in the near future, uh, they have a huge problem on their hands. How to govern Afghanistan? And you know, as coming from a peace institute, you look at drivers of conflict, 
Afghanistan has had the same drivers of conflict for 50 years. And when you look at that foundation, it's, it's ethnic divisions or lack of inclusion, it's reliance on, as a landlocked country on uh, neighbors for positive trade, for usually Western donors for aid. The Taliban are less equipped to overcome any of these obstacles than even the Republic was in its struggle. So they do have a big challenge on their hands. And I think that you know, where to look is how to use a little bit of time. Taliban used to always say, well, you have the watches, we have the time. Mm -hmm. I think that it's reversed a little bit. Now they are responsible for the welfare of Afghans. Obviously, they're doing a poor job. Uh, but that pressure will mount from the bottom, also from the neighbors. The neighbors don't want Afghanistan to be a source of instability for them. We've just heard about terrorist incursions to the north as well as to the east. Uh, that will generate pressure over time if the Taliban can't control it. And then, of course, domestic unrest, I think, will increase as they fail to provide food, services, you know, or even maybe security. So how to work with the region, how to uh, put the pressure on the Taliban to actually govern the country and provide regional as well as domestic security, that will be consolidated pressure over time. But unfortunately, it's not a specific tool that the US or I think Europe can wield to say, change now. When the Republic was crumbling, there was an alternative, not ideal for many, which was the Taliban. But now, what if there is an implosion and the Taliban are gone? Civil war or the unrest or the resistant forces that are taking shapes and nuances steps uh, in central Afghanistan. Shwab, my question to you very specifically. The US was siding with the Republic for 20 years but it did not work the way everyone wanted. Now the Taliban are in town. They have made commitments to the US regarding counterterrorism measures. But the resistant forces are j trying to find ways to gain attention and put a fight against the Taliban. Is it worth an investment? Well, first of all, I'd say the U.S. was supporting the Republic for 19 years. That last year is a bit in the gray area, especially after hearing what General mm -hmm. Aliza said. That's one. Second is I think we have to ask ourselves the question that the region is asking. Countries with borders now controlled by the Taliban. And the question they're asking themselves is, are the Taliban viable long term? Will they still be around for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years? If the answer is yes, there will be a certain set of decisions that they will make. There will be a specific type of engagement that they will have. If their answer is, well, we're not really sure, then we have what we have today. And what do we have today? We have tactical engagements, short-term tactical engagements, which are extremely transactional. Uzbekistan opens its borders for one month, closes it, opens it, closes it. There was a high-level delegation the Taliban delegation, I think the second, third month after they captured Kabul, led by Hanafi, who's a deputy, sheikh, wazir, very fancy titles, went to, went to Tashkent. You know, the Uzbek government welcomed them, and they said, you know, we're going to work, and we're going to do all of this. You know, the region has its own politics. And at the end, they said, well, here's a list of folks that we are very concerned about. Um, why don't you hand them over to us so we can have a long-term relationship? The Taliban delegation made promises, of course, we will do it, don't worry, we have this. The cooperation that the Uzbeks were getting from the Republic. Yes. Regarding well, IMU. Exactly. Yes, thank you. So the Taliban delegation made that commitment. They flew back to Kabul, they sent the list to the military commission of the Taliban. The military commission laughed it off. They threw that list away. They're like, these are our brethren who fought beside us for 20 years. We are not giving them up. So what does that tell us? That tells us that counter-terrorism commitments are ideologically linked to the Taliban. So when we look at potential security arrangements that the region has with the Taliban or any other superpower, you have to question the assumptions. OK, well, they told us they'll do it in Doha. Now, now the framing of the Taliban is different. Now what are we hearing? They're saying, oh, you will not be threatened from Afghan soil. What does that really mean? That means 
we don't really want to say no to all these other foreign friends we have here who've been helping us, but we're going to kind of tell them not to attack and not to do these things. Well, how is that turning out? Attacks, rocket launches in Termez, border skirmishes against Iran, um, uh, border incidents across Tajikistan, the TTP is not going too well. So I think we have to recognize that this consolidation phase, which Dr. Sakhi pointed to, is not going too well for the Taliban. And if we're going to discuss how we engage them moving forward... But realistically speaking, is there an appetite to do something that is opposed to the Taliban, say, a repetition of 20 years? No, 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 that's not what I'm or saying. Or 19 years, according Look, to I you. Think, I think simplifying this conversation to a black and white, either we go in with $100 billion or we do nothing, I don't think that's the conversation. I think what I'm trying to say is let's not lie to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Can we at least not represent the Taliban as something they're not? They're not our friends. They are not going to give up on Al-Qaeda or, or IMU or all these other groups. They're just not going to do it. So knowing that as a fact, what are the realistic possibilities that we have? I mm -hmm. think that's a, that's a tough conversation. But I think that's the real conversation that needs to be taking place rather than this blinded, oh, we're going to have a fancy process. We're going to throw in all this money. We're going to take pictures with, with these ministers. And this will be leverage on them. I think that's deluding ourselves just like we deluded ourselves in the Doha negotiations. And that's going to result in more and more catastrophe and failure. General Sabaliza, you fought the Taliban. And you knew them. You know their proxies. You know their friends. And you know their foes. Daesh is there, increasing attacks, and uh, claiming more and more responsibilities for uh, a number of uh, spectacular attacks. And there are words that soon they are going to start attacking the Taliban leadership. Because according to Daesh's philosophy, Taliban, are, uh, betra uh, Taliban have betrayed Islam, and Taliban are coup conspirators with the US and Western world. But uh, the Taliban uh, have friendship, according to Shraib, and alliances with uh, regional groups. Give us some specifics as, as to how you saw it across Afghanistan, and specifically threats that could be potential uh, threat for um, our neighbors uh, in the north, specifically. Well, uh, uh, in Doha deal, uh, a credit was given to the Taliban as an umbrella provided to all the terrorist groups in Afghanistan active, including IMU, ATIM, Ansarullah, lashkar e taiba TTP, whatever, and all Al-Qaeda branches. In the meantime, they were claiming that they are able to uh, counter Daesh. And they made a drama in east of Afghanistan as well during 2019, we all remember. But that's not the case. First of all, Taliban are used to be three groups. Now they are going to become four groups. One group is uh, Haqqanis. Second group is Kandaharis. Third group is Helmandis. Sadar Ibrahim, who is a follower for Akhtar Mansur, who was killed in a drone strike. And Balochistan coming from Iran, and he, they have really close ties with Iranians as well. And the, third, the fourth group is now popping up in the north of Afghanistan, like Mahdi Mujahid and uh, 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 the other, uh, one other Uzbek commander, Mahdoum Alam, who used to be the regional commander for Taliban during uh, 18, 19, 20. And those groups are, are going to join Daesh. If we go back to 2017 and 18 in Darza Valley, there was a Daesh representation in there. Kari Hekmat was their leader, and there were some other leaders of Daesh who were tied to some politicians of those days in Afghanistan, and then it was just kept uh, so, 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 uh, so much uh, out of reach of the media. And then Right now, the same thing is happening. In the meantime, the Daesh attacks on Tajikistan in Badakhshan, Daesh attacks on Termes, it shows that Taliban are not able to control all those, all those terrorist groups in Afghanistan. And in the meantime, the Ansarullah, the IMU, the ATIM, 
are very close partners under the commitment of the Al-Qaeda and the Mawlay Mansour's group who, are, who has given, especially ATIM, uh, 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 a base in Zabul district, uh, uh, Zabul province of Afghanistan and South. So it means they, 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 they have strong relationships and they are still lying to the international community, they are lying to the regional uh, countries, and they are lying to their own people. Now, I think including all these problems in Afghanistan, in my opinion, there is still some hope. However, I'm a, I'm a straightforward military officer, and I just knew fighting during the years, and Taliban knows us very well. And they knew they can't take it. But now I say, in the last 40, 45 years, uh, every government in Afghanistan has shown up. They have come with power and they were dropped by power. So it means it would be very beautiful if our government would be fallen by a demonstration of a million people on the roads, a demonstration that would throw President Ghani and his corrupt team away, not the entire government, including the ANDSF with all those uh, uh, massive number of uh, uh, casualties. Who are we fighting for? For Afghan people. Now we need to know what the Afghans want really. Are they happy for the future to throw Taliban with fighting? Which is easy. Which is easy. But what will be the outcome? There will be another resistance under the umbrella of Islamic extremism and radicalism against us for the future years. In the meantime, Afghanistan ethnic and tribal problems will, will, will be another problem, which we need to... So you're saying uh, the current resistance that are just at nuanced stages should not be taking place? Uh, that's an option. It's an option. Uh, it's not an it's obligation. An it's not a must. I, I, I don't... I don't uh, 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 I, I'm not thinking this is the first option, okay. but it could be the last option. Why I'm saying this? If Taliban are saying that they are representing Afghan people, if the resistance is saying they are re rep uh, representing Afghan people, if we are saying, as the new generation who, was, uh, who, who were the investment of democracy post-2001, and we were born in Afghanistan, and we just came to such positions fighting and, 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 and representing the democracy, studying in Western world, and, and all, most of us studied in, in very uh, 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 high-level universities and well-known universities. We all, if we think we care about Afghanistan, then the fight should not be the first option. Thank you. We should go for some other options that we, we are thinking are still in place. Thank you. Uh, Shwa Ibrahim says, uh, Dr. Seb Sakhi, we have to look the Taliban what, for what they are realistically. General Alizai, despite his military experience in actual fight, suggests something different. Please unpack this for us. Is resistance the way to go? And if we're talking about uh, representation of the will of the Afghan people, the Republic continuously said, you know, the elected government of Afghanistan, the, representative, the rightful representative of the people. Same narrative by the Taliban. We are the actual uh, representatives of the Afghan people, not brought by the U.S. and uh, U.S. occupiers. When the Taliban came in, women started protesting against them for their rightful rights. They were threatened, they were detained, and they were uh, told that they would be wedded to Taliban fighters should they choose to protest again. Two opposite sides. Is there a realistic way of moving forward? Well, sure, about women. I hear tears of tens of women every day on the phone who were civil servants, who were professors at the university, who were teachers calling me that they're sitting at home, right? Because of Taliban policy. There are tens of calls that I receive on a daily basis with the tears of women 
sitting at home, cooking, and crying meanwhile. And that's what they're sending me picture. Now, that's what we are doing, you know, with the Taliban takeover. So going back to your question, look, we are talking about the totalitarian system, right? Taliban, as if we just look at the foundation of Taliban, it's a hardliner militant group with a very strict ideology, right? And the fragmentation already we know within them, and there are lots of talk about Taliban 2.0 that I don't personally believe in that, right? So it is a, totalit a complete totalitarian system. We, if we want or don't want, the resistance will create. Mm -hmm. The pockets of insurgency will, will emerge. If we want or don't want, people will go to the roads on the roads. If we want or don't want, protests will continue, right? Why? Because in totalitarian system, when you um, uh, create a coercive state, right? You sideline and you silence a group of people. And that group of people, so what generally happens from case studies around the world, you create grievances among the population in large. And as a student of peace, that grievances will cause frustration, aggression. Something that, that the Taliban were used to exactly. and took an advantage of exactly. in their days. Exactly. And that aggression, you never know what, what can come out of that. That can come as a form of resistance, armed conflict. Or that could be people on the road in the, in the shape of revolution of 1980s, right? So with the, with the whole nature of Taliban, I think um, uh, that will going to happen. Uh, either, either we want or no, the, the, and also with the, my previous argument about the, their ties as a militant group with the other militancies, uh, these insurgencies were going to create. And on the other hand, the silenced population, the progress that going to emerge as another resistance, form of resistance on the, on the country. Now, what's the way forward, right? right? As, as you are asking about the way forward. Look, there are, yes, I, I'm, not, I'm not for war. That's my ideology, I'm not for war. War brings more distraction and, and, and chaos to the country and, 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 and will, will, will destroy the fundamentals of society. So that is not a solution. If we all remember the peace process, the peace process had to end up with a political settlement, all right? Peace process of 2002 as a failure, and this so-called political peace process of 2018 by Ambassador Khalilzad, they actually promised that let's do a political settlement, right? So yes, um, President Ghani fled and all other uh, scenarios, but actually the political settlement component was missing from the entire. Now, Taliban shouldn't come should then actually uh, took the control of a Arab palace, right? They should have waited for that political settlement to happen. And if they haven't waited, they should see the consequence now. So there shouldn't be really so much flexibility with the Taliban in terms of, because they are still bargaining, by the way. They are still bargaining. So, so that political settlement component requires the world to look back to Afghanistan, including the United States. I've been telling in many platforms. There is need for a political process in Afghanistan. There is no appetite. I completely agree at this point, right? Because of Ukraine, because of so many other, and, and the world is tired, to be honest, with Afghanistan. But the political process has to start, and that political process has to end up with a political settlement that was promised by the world, by the international community, by the US for Afghanistan. So that has to happen now. War is not the solution. Scott, it has to start, will it? Look, I think you know part of your earlier question was uh, what will be the U.S. appetite right. for engagement in Afghanistan, and and I think it is a challenge. Uh, we're distracted by other priorities. Uh, China and the rise of China, which we've just talked about here, is a is a preoccupation, a top foreign policy concern, and of course, uh, the situation in Ukraine as well. Um, you know, the fundamental interests of the U.S rely on stability in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And I think those fundamentals will uh, reinforce engagement over time. It's certainly not going to be at the level of attention or investment, maybe helpfully so, uh, as the past 20 years. Um, but I think that there will be uh, steady engagement. And unfortunately, I think that crises will arise. We've talked about the fundamental instability of the situation and the risks, not to mention uh, the, the deprivations of the, of the Afghan people in terms of livelihoods, in terms of rights, food. So the U.S. engagement, I think, will continue at a fairly steady pace. As far as, and I totally Just for with, historical context, the Taliban took over for the first time uh, Kabul and started ruling the country in two, uh, 1996. 
up until 2001 and the uh, unfortunate September 11 attacks, the world was not paying attention to Afghanistan. When September 11 happened, you know, things changed. God forbid, are we waiting for something like this to, to get attention again at a global stage? Look, certainly I, I hope not, but I would, I would contrast. I think some lessons have been learned from the uh, complete uh, abandonment, let's say, of the country, the, the lack of interest in the country in, uh, at the end, early 90s, that then led to the Taliban. Uh, the level of engagement by the U.S., by the international community in the form of humanitarian assistance alone, but also, as you mentioned, there are diplomatic missions there, not ours, not the U.S. Uh, that's at a much greater order of magnitude than in the 90s, and it needs to continue uh, at a certain level of engagement. Um, can I just say also that I agree with what Dr. Saki said? You know, ultimately, a political process is needed. Uh, to, to rebalance the, the political situation uh, and make it more stable. I think it's not the U.S. place, I mean, after, after the last few years, to initiate that. Mm -hmm. We don't have the leverage. Uh, I don't know if we have the credibility. Uh, it's something that has to come from Afghans. And a, and a point that I will make is, you know, the Taliban, everybody has acknowledged, is in full control of the country in a remarkable way. But it's not because they're strong. I think it's really relative to the weakness of other political groups and factions, uh, which are badly divided for some good reasons, for some not good reasons. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I like the idea of a, of a million Afghan march, <laughs> whether it's possible. Uh, but I think, I believe, uh, coming from the outside, that, that the vast majority of Afghans are not happy with the Taliban rule, put that broadly. So how does that get organized? How can there be a more unifying political movement that would form the basis of a, of a settlement? Because the strength for that turns out was inadequate uh, for a variety of reasons from the US in the Doha process. It's certainly going to be inadequate now if it's a Western or US-led process. And so there needs to be some other source uh, of, of, of Afghan unity that is opposed to the Taliban in a peaceful way, in my view, I agree with that, uh, for uh, I think international community, U.S. included, to help and support. Thank you. Uh, before moving to the audience, uh, Shrive, you have the opportunity uh, to express your thoughts on moving forward. I'd like to say I'd like to state that um, war is war is inevitable when all political options fail, and I think we have to recognize which political actor is in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. The political actor that's in the driver's seat is the Taliban. The problem of this conversation that's happening sometimes in certain policy bubbles in wherever is, well, let's tell those other people who are defending their homes and villages to stop instigating this beast called the Taliban so we can have peace and political reconciliation. It doesn't make sense. The only party which is not allowing actual political reconciliation to happen are the Taliban themselves. Mm -hmm. And we can achieve that if they change their behavior. Now, what's happening? Will they? The world is sending them the wrong message. The world is telling them we don't care. The world told them in Doha we don't care. We're sending you billions of dollars. Doha has become the capital of the Taliban. Embassies and, and, and special reps are engaging them. People are taking selfies and pictures with them. The Taliban are not fools. Why are we assuming they are? We're telling them, we're using words, but our actions continuously demonstrate to them that you are the reality and you don't have to change. So what does that tell the people? That, that's telling the people that we have to survive the Taliban. And what are the Taliban doing inside the country? Whatever they're doing is resulting in the self-defense. It's resulting in its pockets <clears throat> of resistance. So the question is, can we avoid an escalation of an already going war? Unfortunately, based on Taliban behavior, my answer is no. If they change... But do they have the resistant forces, the tools, the equipment, the leadership... I think that's a Inside Afghanistan question. to do what you're saying to do, because according to you... Taliban have all the incentives, domestically and from a global perspective, to go with the status quo. That is not negotiate, be the ruler, and do the business as usual. 
Well, I think, I think this is the, the question that we have failed to answer as, uh, as a people for the past four decades. The cycle that's repeating itself, no one has been able to break it. And the trajectory that the Taliban are, are on right now is going to lead to an escalation um, uh, of this conflict where people are forced to defend themselves. People are forced to defend their homes, their villages, their identity. Um, and the world but is, that, is telling them is, that, is it's that okay. level of resistance enough for a fundamental change? Let me be very specific. Uh, you know, the uh, oppositions that are sitting in Turkey and in Tajikistan and other places trying to form groups, do they have the momentum, the resources to do what it takes to bring fundamental Look, change? A lot, or of the, come a lot of the former political actors have been massively discredited in the eyes of the people of the country. That is a fact. Mm -hmm. But whether or not they're militarily relevant or not is a separate question. I think what I'm trying to get at is you don't need to look at the same you old suspects, the same faces. You need to look at what's happening on the ground. What's happening on the ground <coughs> is that people are not happy. Mm -hmm. And they will only wait for so long when the calculation changes. When the calculation changes, I think we have to prepare for one of two scenarios. We can either wait and see and then, unfortunately, break down into a Syr Syria-like conflict where it's everyone against everyone. Mm -hmm. It's extremely chaotic. Mm -hmm. Or we can, we can engage the reality of the Taliban as they are and try to co-opt this by actually holding them accountable, not sending in the message that we don't really care, you can do whatever you want, and then have a shot at political reconciliation. I think that right now we are in a very... Uh, downward spiral when it comes to uh, um, this conflict, and I'm not optimistic. Thank you. Uh, let's open up for questions. All right. Uh, can we get the mic, please? Uh, yes, please. Over there, uh, the general lady with uh, red dress. Pink. <laughs> Just joking. Uh, I'm, my name is Irina. I'm a uh, Kampka Network fellow from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, last year, I was heavily involved, and in, um, I was in fact recruited by one of the by one U.S. organization uh, to help out to evacuate our uh, fellows from uh, Afghanistan. And uh, in fact, what we've uh, realized that a lot of the bright minds have already left Afghanistan, and the ones whom we've tried to evacuate were either government officials uh, with their families, and a lot of the uh, fellows who took a very crucial uh, positions at different levels in businesses, etc. And my question is more, I've, I, I mean, look at you guys, you know, the, the, the best minds, the brilliant minds, I think the best resources are already out of Afghanistan. And, uh, you said that there's hope, you know, things will change. And my question would be like, who, I mean, who is your biggest hope on? I mean, are you hoping the opposition based in different places will change the things? Do you hope the people in Afghanistan will change the situation? I mean, who is your biggest hope to you know, change the situation? Because it's very hard to be outside of the country and try to, you know, to do anything. Thank you. Um, General Tabalizai. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you are the hopeful one here. Yes. Uh, <laughs> always uh, uh, military should be hopeful. So totalitarian, as you said, it's a hope that Taliban can't govern uh, just as one group ruling the entire country if there is no inclusion. Another hope, Taliban uh, still have uh, acting uh, cabinet which means they are also waiting for something to happen. Another thing, the Doha uh, office is still active. You know what is missing? An address for the collapsed Afghan government is missing. That is including... That's in St. Regis uh, Hotel in Abu Dhabi. Such talent that is including such talent as you mentioned they have to come together under one umbrella first. Then the reliance has to come together. 
And then from one address, we need to talk with Taliban, whether they want to fight or they want to solve the problem with talks and politics. Because the best thing is politics. After 40, 45 years, it's still early that we realized that we should solve our problems with talking. But still, if they want to fight, you know, they know us, they will have a very hard time as but they are But according to Shoaib right Rahim, now. the knife has already reached the bone. Taliban have shown their true colors and they are not willing to negotiate. So, they are not willing to change. So here is the point, a word, a phrase, as soon as possible. Before okay. it goes more into the bone, it just touched the bone in one year. In next one year, it will be into the bone, and then it will take more resources, more energy, and, 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 and more time to solve the problem. Okay. You see, you know, the war in Afghanistan, even our proverbs are very violent in graphic. Sorry for that. Uh, a very dear friend of Afghanistan. And then Arabic. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this camp. For people who don't know me, I'm David Sedney. I was formerly the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Central Asia in the Obama administration, more recently President of the American University of Afghanistan in Kabul. I left Kabul a little, a little over a year ago. I'd like to perhaps shift the discussion a little bit because this discussion about who did what and who was more corrupt uh, among Afghans is something that I find not very productive, mm -hmm. even though there's lots of um, uh, reasons for that. But my question is really to all of you in the audience as well. Um, I'm not a member of CAMCA, although I've hosted uh, many of you for uh, meetings at the Pentagon and even a reception at my home and, and look forward to doing it again. But to me, there's a big white, or, or a big elephant in the room of these discussions. Um, over the past year, in the Kamka area, we've had three successful wars, or two successful wars and one that may be successful. The Taliban won a military victory in Afghanistan. Azerbaijan and Turkey won a military victory over Armenia. Russia may well win a military victory in Ukraine. As someone who worked in the Department of Defense and someone who has worked with USIP and a lot of things, there are a lot of people who say violence doesn't solve anything. These conflicts have to be resolved by negotiation. That's wrong. People who believe that are wrong. And you need to realize that. Because in order for conflicts to be resolved by negotiation, all the sides involved have to want to negotiate. But if one side, the Taliban, Armenia, Russia, decides that it wants to fight, that its national interests are so strong that it is going to fight and win the war, then they are going to triumph over those people who want to negotiate. The basic weakness of the US position, the Afghan government's position, is they were negotiating with an opponent that did not want to negotiate. They never seriously negotiated, as my friend Shuai Ibrahim said. They were never serious about negotiation. They played the United States, they played the Afghan government, but in the end, they wanted a military solution. So what does this all mean for all of you from Kamka? What does it mean for all of you? It means you can't trust promises from the rest of the world that they will negotiate, that they will put in sanctions, that they will do X, Y, and Z short of military force. I will offer you another model, the country I lived in for a number of years, Switzerland, middle of Europe, has been able to stick, keep out of wars because of its porcupine philosophy. The entire population's mobilized. They spend a very large amount of money on weapons uh, in order to be able to protect their people. So I would just offer to all of you that a lot of the discussions that you hear about conflict uh, and about the need for negotiation, and sorry, Scott Warden, I apologize for some of the USIP. I know this goes against your basic philosophy, but peace is not possible unless you are willing to fight and die for it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last question. Uh, Arvik, I'll get uh, her question, question and then we'll do the uh, closing okay, remarks. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I just really want to thank you, uh, Zafar, for an excellent moderation and all the panelists and I believe many in the room uh, only know the headline story of Afghanistan and for unpacking it the way you did, it's, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, professor, you said that this is a tragedy for Afghanistan. No, it's a tragedy for the entire 
democracy and human rights and the world. And Armenia didn't want to fight the war, by the way, against uh, 95 million combined population. But I have a question. Um, in between the lines, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm listening to sentiments. One is that um, there, there is a little bit of a still reliance on the international community for getting involved. But on the other hand, there is a kind of a, um, indication that something has to come from within. I'm wondering, um, is there a need, or do you see there has to be a need to step back, reflect, and uh, maybe think that no one really is going to care unless there is a true international or US or Western interest and that there has to be a mobilization from within or there is still a hope that maybe there is a Western or Eastern or Southern power that is going to come and again save uh, the people of Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go from the last and come all the way to Scott, one minute each, just to close. Great, thank you. Um, two comments. First, to confirm and to reaffirm what, what David said. I think the sentiment inside the country, in General Ali Zai portrays this, is that this peace process was weaponized. This peace process was used against the armed forces of the Republic of Afghanistan and our people. And it was not the first time. The Geneva Accords in 1988 was also weaponized against the government of the time. Because it did not lead to peace. It led to collapse. Okay. Right? That's one. Second is, I think, um, I think that, in, uh, in terms of Arabic's question, this is a very internationalized conflict since the 70s. Ever since the 78 military coup by the leftists, which was driven and supported by Moscow, Foreign forces beyond our strength have been involved in this conflict. So you will always hear this balance of what the role of international actors are and the domestic actors, and that interplay will always be relevant in Afghanistan, unfortunately. Thank you. Dr. Seb Sahi. Well, I have two po three points to make, just I will answer your question as well. Uh, I completely agree. There should be mobilization within, in the hope, going back to one of you ask. Uh, I, I'm hopeful about the people of Afghanistan, and, and that's the people who change the circumstances. So investment on the people, channeling even funding, if international community wants to fund, or invest, or I don't know, channel programs, that should be on the people. Education is the most important element to target at this particular time when a system is, when there's a totalitarian system in place. Uh, whenever there are, there's radical system in place, you try to mobilize internal forces. And that internal forces will be the cause of the collapse of totalitarian systems. That always works in different case studies. So I think, yes, people mobilization is one of the main, main uh, area that has to be focused. The other uh, engagement, we're talking a lot about engagement. Actually, I'm, 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 I'm writing a piece now uh, since one year anniversary of Taliban is going to complete within the next two months. So, uh, and I'm looking at different kinds of engagement. I think it was unconditional engagement since the Doha Agreement was signed. That has, and the unconditional agreement, sorry, conditional um, engagement did not bring concrete changes in the Taliban's behavior, policy, and attitude. So now, there should be some short-term conditional engagement with the Taliban, if we really want to check Taliban, because it's the check and balance process, you know, what you do, transaction, as you mentioned. So the conditional, for, for a short time, that should be targeted by the international community, including the US to see how that goes, especially because the country is in dire need of humanitarian crisis. And people really need food, shelter, and basic needs to survive. And the third one, which I uh, mentioned, I, I'm going to reiterate again, Afghanistan needs a political process to end to a political settlement. And without that, pumping money into the country is not going to help. Thank because you. for any functioning economy, you need a state. And that state is incapable. The regime is incapable to, to run the country. So any, the money pumping of money is not going to resolve the economic situation of Afghanistan without changing the system from the thank top. Thank you. Uh, General Ali Zai, one minute. Yeah, thank you. So I, I will still for, push for, for talks. Uh, uh, and uh, there's, there's no other way as a first option than starting, fi, fi, uh, just fi, uh, finding an address for the old Afghan government that most of us were part of and especially the armed forces, the ANDSF, who, who took the whole 
weight of the last 20 years conflict on your shoulders. So if someone is going and talking with old leaders in behalf of us, that's going to be, uh, we will be against that because we still are connected to our soldiers in Afghanistan. We are talking to them. So we are aside of all these talks that the, the international community need to have our perspective Thank you. based on the reality as well. And then talking is always good. Reliances will become, and uh, if Taliban, uh, it depends on them, if then they choose the fight or the, the, the peaceful way, uh, uh, Afghan people won't blame us uh, uh, that we uh, uh, just pull them to but another you didn't fight. Try. We pull them to another fight without trying uh, a peaceful uh, uh, solution for Afghanistan. Thank you. You've got the last one. Um, well, I don't disagree that much with, uh, with David's comments, although you're certainly wearing your DOD hat rather than your state or your, your presidency hat in those comments. I, I think that, yeah, surely you need to have strong power to be in a good negotiating position. But I also think that while that includes military power, uh, it also, I think even more importantly, includes political power. And I think that was uh, missing from the equation. Uh, and then I would also segue to, to the comments in front here. I also agree this was a loss not just for Afghans, uh, for Afghan Democrats, but for democracy. Uh, and, and there again, I think a lot of my work in country in Afghanistan was around the election process. Um, that had deep flaws, of course, but uh, being there, you know, Afghans were strongly, a vast majority of Afghans were strongly committed to the system of democracy as against totalitarianism, as for choosing your leaders. And I think that you know, one of the lessons that needs to be learned, apart from the negotiation process, apart from the military collapse, is why did the democracy uh, over 20 years, which mm -hmm. is young for a 200 year democracy, which is suffering here, uh, but still <laughs> there was a decent amount of time to plant deeper roots uh, I'm really saddened and shocked that they w were torn up so easily. And I think learning those lessons of why there wasn't a stronger representation and a stronger ownership of government by the Afghans who don't want the Taliban is something that we should learn. Thank you. Uh, I know that emotions are raw. I know that people feel very strong and sentimental about what happened and the factors that led to what happened in Afghanistan. Uh, with that uh, in mind, there is one thing between us and a delicious lunch that is a necessary round of applause for our wonderful panelists and our audience. <laughs>